people in New York on Wall Street who sell information about markets from the Wall Street Journal to various investment newsletters. The efficient market hypothesis basically says that uh, stocks and other commodities are efficiently priced. If you believe that, your stock price should look like that. But anybody who's looked at stock market information knows it doesn't look like that. It looks more like that. So Soros would say that at any point in time, any financial instrument is always either overvalued or undervalued. And the trick is to figure out which. Is it undervalued or overvalued? And if you can figure that out, then you can play these trends rather than that trend. And hence, by going long or short, you can get a higher return. This is what hedge fund managers do. And Soros has proven to be unusually talented at that. One of the reasons that this happens is because the market influences the events that they anticipate. Uh, there are something called momentum investors. So that if, and there's a, a newspaper called uh, Investor's Business Daily, which tries to invent a, identify momentum stocks. That is, they try to find a small unknown stock that's rising, and they tell their readers that, and some readers try to hop on the bandwagon and ride it up. The problem is that it might be a new business which is going to catch on and prosper, but it might be a misperception. In other words, you may be simply riding a publicity wave from Investor's Business Daily and other uh, issues. And I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. So let's contrast equilibrium theory with reflexivity theory. As I explained in an earlier drawing, the classical economic conception is that if the price increases, the demand will decrease because it'll be more expensive, people won't want to buy it. But if demand increases, the price will increase in order to control the supply. Soros says that doesn't happen. That if the price increases, very often the demand increases because of momentum investors. Oh, it's going up, I want to buy. Or if it starts going down, they say, whoops, it's going down, I better sell. So as a result of these responses to price, you get positive feedback. And it's these positive feedback loops that generate this kind of short-term fluctuation. Now, you, maybe some of it's due to random walk, but some of it's due to this reflexive process. To illustrate what he means by reflexivity, in his book, The Alchemy of Finance, he gives several examples. And the easiest one to understand, I think, is the conglomerate boom. So let me explain the conglomerate boom. Let's say you have a high-tech company like Ling Timco Vought. Uh, they made fighter planes for the Pentagon and various other high-tech electronic equipment. They had a lot of money. They had, had won a number of contracts. Uh, they thought, well, maybe the Pentagon will cut back at some point, so let's diversify. Let's buy some consumer products companies like Procter & Gamble uh, that makes toothpaste and soap. Now, in a high-tech company, it grows fast, so you, pay, you have a high price-to-earnings ratio, like about 40, uh, because you expect your return to come in growth, not dividends. In a consumer products company, uh, demand is more stable, so you expect a higher return in terms of dividends. So the price to earnings ratio is about 10. All right. So you have a high-tech company that buys consumer products companies that generate a lot of dividends. Well, then people say, well, oh, it's got a lot of dividends, so it's worth more. So the price rises. With a higher price, 
you can borrow against the price of the stock and buy more consumer products companies, which generates more dividends, which people interpret as meaning the stock is worth more because it's a high-tech company. You borrow against that, buy more consumer products companies, and you've found the secret of good management. <laughs> Until stock analysts look at the company and say, wait a minute, this is no longer a high-tech company. This is largely a consumer products company. The high price earnings ratio is not justified, and the price drops. Source says that in stocks, you get a, a gradual run-up and then an immediate drop. But in the currency markets, you get long-term waves. So that in currency markets, he says you have time to catch the trend, whereas in stocks, you have to be careful because it may peak just about the time you've figured it out. So you can analyze the conglomerate boom in terms of ideas, groups, the corporate managers who buy other companies, investors who believe in something new and foolproof versus the investors who use reflexivity theory. And then you can analyze it in terms of variables. So you can use ideas, groups, events, and variables to describe the behavior of the system. And as you see, there is a positive feedback loop here where the perception of the company influences the price of the company, which influences the perception of the company. And that's the positive feedback that he's talking about. There was also a similar case of the venture capital boom when there was a lot of investment in uh, new electronic uh, equipment. Uh, and in each case, you have a positive feedback loop, which is eventually corrected with a negative feedback loop. This often happens. Uh, you get a new industry. Those who are in the industry first make a great deal of money, but that attracts other people. Then you get competition and your profits drop. Similarly, there's a credit cycle. Uh, and this had a uh, real estate uh, boom. And then things got overbuilt, and uh, a lot of people uh, lost out in the... Uh, Here's the way he analyzes the uh, currency market. The usual currency market is just um, imports, exports with the value of the dollar in between and two negative feedback loops. But as you can see, his analysis has positive loops every place, three positive loops, which means that you have a positive loop going up and then you have a positive loop going down. And he maintained that under Carter, you had a vicious circle of inflation and declining dollar. Whereas under Reagan, you had a benign circle of a rising dollar and rising exports without inflation. So finance professors mostly build mathematical models. Soros is engaged in a multi-person game. Behavioral finance is a growing field, but it tends to focus on defining the limits to the assumption that people are rational actors rather than a sort of comprehensive view of the behavior of the economy. So to compare equilibrium theory versus reflexivity theory is, I think, a way of thinking about a scientific revolution in economics. So I would pose that to you as a as a hypothesis, uh, that what we see here is a pattern similar to the pattern in second order cybernetics. Whereas equilibrium theory said that information becomes immediately available to everybody versus people act on incomplete information. People are rational actors or people are influenced by their biases. Economic systems go quickly to equilibrium or social systems display boom and bust cycles. The left-hand column is well-developed. The right-hand column is Soros's conception. Similarly, either a theorist is outside the system observed or observers are part of the system. They're actors and they're biased. Scientists should build theories uh, using quantifiable variables or scientists should use a variety of descriptions. 
Theories do not alter the system described, or theories are a means to change the system described. Uh, Soros frequently writes articles saying that the international financial system needs to be better regulated, that it's, uh, it can cause major problems. Long-term capital management was an example that almost wrecked the international system. So rather than having uh, a belief in complete information, rationality, and equilibrium, you can have incomplete information, bias, disequilibrium, gaps between perception and reality, and boom and bust cycles. And I would emphasize that uh, the one gaps between perception and reality. This is the issue that has been at the foundation of Soros's work, which is really not considered that much by social scientists and others. People have a tendency to develop an idea and then believe it. Whereas Soros develops an idea and treats it as a hypothesis. And if events turn against him, he gets out quickly. Whereas other people, I know I'm right about this. I, I just know it's going to turn around. And they write it down and they lose a lot of money. Whereas if it turns against him, Soros says, well, I got that one wrong and sells out. Uh, many people have attributed his success to his speed at abandoning firmly held beliefs uh, and moving on to develop another hypothesis. So Soros looks for gaps between perception and reality. As, for example, the belief in the USSR that they were the most advanced society, that they were at the vanguard of civilization, that they were leading the way into the future. As soon as Gorbachev permitted glasnost or openness and people could see that that was not the case, the legitimacy of the Communist Party collapsed. So when you have a gap between perception and reality, you tend to get a collapse. He sees it in economics, and he sees it in political science. And the way he made money in the financial markets was by pointing out gaps between perception and reality, selling, distributing the information, and then collecting on the collapse. And in the case of political systems, he encouraged the collapse by installing um, copiers, internet connections, and so forth, in an effort to build civil society. So large gaps mean the system is unstable, and legitimacy collapses. Now, the alternative thinking in political scientists was the convergence theory. This was the idea that the West would adopt elements of a welfare state, uh, health care, housing, education, etc., for the poor. And um, the communist countries would allow the market to enter into shops, if not heavy industry, then at least some private ownership of small business. The West did adopt some elements of a welfare state, which we're now cutting back on, but the USSR did not adopt much in the way of a market economy. China is now doing that. Uh, but this notion of the convergence theory was the alternative to Soros's theory of a gap between perception and reality and then collapse. So what Soros looks for in his investments is rapid growth as a result of positive feedback and instability before collapse. And that's the way he's able to ride trends, short-term trends, and hence to get a higher return than the people who are looking for that trend. There are people in the finance world who simply say, well, it's you know, if you have a large number of investors, somebody's going to be highly successful, and so Soros just got lucky. 
Well, that's one interpretation. But that also says that the only 